business. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Marsha Diamond, and I'm business development with All You Serve. And we'll get started in a few minutes. But um, you all had registered for Is It Okay to Be Green? And we have Anthony Russo here with me. Um, some housekeeping tips. Um, the PowerPoint and the recording will be available next week on at www.allyouserve.com. If you have any questions, please feel free to um, type them in. And at the end of the presentation, if we get time, we will take some of those questions. Otherwise, we can answer them and send them out or post them on the website at www.allyouserve.com. So we will get started momentarily. And thank you for all joining us this afternoon. Must be a hot topic because we had close to 85 people uh, registered for this event. So definitely a hot topic. We want to give people time to come on to the time frame. We'll give another minute and we will get started. Okay, I'm gonna one second. Okay, to bring it back to my screen. Oops. Marsha, I'm getting a, a message to ask. A blank. Well, it just says uh, I've been made the presenter. When ready, click show my screen. Okay, now that'll come back to me. Actually, so everybody, we're a little difficulties. We're going to get it. Um, Okay, here it is. Okay. 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 We'll get started. Welcome. It's okay to be green. Welcome to our All You Serve webinar for December. Um, and I have with me Anthony Russo, the president of Earth Smart. And uh, Anthony, I'll let you get started. Thank you, Marsha, and thank you for everybody uh, taking the time to come. Um, Marsha, I'm having a little bit of problem. It won't let me advance slides here. There we go. Good? Uh, yeah, are you ad advancing them for me? or? Um, you should. Let me just. Uh, yeah, you should be able to do it now. Oh, nope, I don't want to do this. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, folks, technical okay. glitches. Where? Okay. Uh, we should go back to your screen and then give just give me the keyboard and mouse. Correct. Right. Uh, okay. It gives more time for people to get on. Okay. Anthony, you have it. So you can take the mouse. Yeah, it's not uh, not letting me click through. Use, use the click or it's not letting you? No. All right. You want me to do it? Yep. Okay. So go ahead and click through. Folks, okay. how many of you have received this memo any time in the past uh, year or two? Um, this is an increasingly popular memo that's coming out to food service departments 
and at first glance it may present a little bit of panic, especially if you haven't done a green initiative proposal in your food service department. Um, it, it, it's a lot of uh, tension up front. Go ahead and click through. Um, well, once that memo comes through, there's always a lot of questions that follow. Um, questions like, what does green really mean? Um, what do I need to know about how to do this in my department? Uh, where do I go to get the information? What do I do next? I mean, where do I go from here? And after this presentation, you should have a good understanding of how, your green food how to green your food service department and what it all means. You'll be able to do it now. Anthony should be able to do it. Uh, that's not allowing me nope. to click through. OK. Then I will do so, it. When I pause, you can just move forward. So what in the world is green? <laughs> Um, green's a concept that really has no defined and universally accepted standards. I've been in the green business for about seven years. Uh, we were green before anyone knew what green was, and we're still waiting for some authoritative body to kind of tell us what green is. But that being said, green has different meanings to different people and in different situations. But green is generally thought of as a system or a process or a set of products that benefits the environment in some way, shape, or form. And what I mean by benefits is if you're changing in the process of greening from something that does not have any or has a strong environmental impact and you're changing to something that has less of an impact, that's considered greening at this point in time. Uh, next slide, Marcia. Next slide. Um, there we go. So where do we begin? Um, with those simple definitions um, and, and no real structure, we got to figure out what we mean here. So we've got to get on the uh, line and take off. So let's start with some definitions that are relevant to healthcare food service, and it'll help us build a knowledge base to create a program in your food service department and help you to green the department. Next slide. Um, the first term that we hear all the time is the term biodegradability, and this term means simply that something will break down in nature given time. I want to caution you that although this term is used very freely when you start talking to suppliers and vendors and consultants about greening, it should not be a consideration in your decision processes as you move forward because there's no quantifiable, quantifiable way to determine what biodegradability biodegradability really means as it relates to the time of degradation and also our federal government here has called biodegradability a term that cannot be used in advertising and I know you do see it in advertising all the time but it is a banned term in advertising. Um, a perfect example is a, a glass soda bottle. Given enough time, millions of years, it will biodegrade. But that makes no sense for us in our normal lifespans and our normal businesses. The second term you'll hear uh, when you're talking about greening is sustainability. And sustainability, simply put, like you see there, is the ability of something to endure. And for the purposes of, of greening a food service department, that kind of, um, it, it, and for purposes of product selection, it kind of has to do with the raw materials of the products and how they're harvested and will that resource endure? And that can be anything from seafood to produce to the disposable choices you make in your food service establishment. And the other term, one of the other terms you'll hear is compostable. And compostable, all that means is it refers to the, a product's ability to degrade in nature given a specific set of conditions. And that's important because you're going to see compostable all over the place as it relates to green when you're evaluating products for your food service department. And there are tests for compostability which are put on which are developed by the American Standards for Testing Materials. And the two standards are 6400 and 6868. And that's for basically compostable plastics and papers that have compostable plastic liners. A lot of the things we use in food service. Not important to understand how those tests go but uh, and, and, and how they work. 
but we'll get to why they're important later. But compostable is an important term. Um, recycled content, you'll come across this when greening. Well, there's two types of recycled content, and it's important to know the difference between the two. When you see the term post-consumer recycled content, that's like the newspaper or the cardboard that you would recycle in your blue bin at home uh, that the trash pickup would come by. Or in the case of healthcare, all of those cardboard boxes that are stacked up, that's post-consumer recycled content. And then there's also pre-consumer recycled content, which is just paper scraps within the factory that they reprocess into more paper. So when greening, recycled content can be a consideration in, in some of the products you choose. Um, oops. Oh, I guess it's letting me do it now, Marcia. Um, okay. waste, waste volume reduction, important concept in greening. You need to really kind of know what it's about. It's about pulping and contact, uh, compacting. I know a lot of the facilities out there have pulpers, and uh, I've watched pulpers being used for many years. Um, they're an effective waste volume reduction technique. And I'll kind of tie all these concepts together in, in a little bit later. But uh, these two terms are very important in greening your food service. So now that I kind of know what the, the core ideas are about turning a food service department green, where do I start? What do I do? How do I get there from here? Well, first, um, we need to decide what green means to your facility. And this decision will, will provide the framework for future decisions, things like product selection, methodology, and procedures. Um, so I wanted to make it kind of simple, because when you boil all these green concepts down, there's, there's really three of them in, in combination that will effectively green your food service department. And at this point, I, I, I want to mention, I'm primarily focusing on the retail side of the business, the cafeterias. Trayline, I'll mention at the end of this presentation and some things that are going on there, but the vast majority of your consumable product and uh, you, you know, your other products are in the retail segment. So keep that in mind when we go through this. But the suggested green concepts when you're greening food service is a sustainable focused approach where most of the disposables the seafood you purchase, the produce you purchase, the things you do are sustainable in nature. Some people don't have availability of a lot of these sustainable products. So another approach would be the compostable focused approach. If there's commercial composting in your area, you might look at tying sustainable disposables with composting, food scrap, and those disposables to make a real green environmentally friendly package where everything you bring in the facility is sustainable within reason and when it leaves it has an end of use where it turns into compost and it's not sitting in a landfill. Um, if both of those are just impossible but you're still being asked to green your facility, one effective strategy is waste reduction focus. Uh, you know, we, we all have trash trucks coming up to our facility. They're hauling away vast amounts of waste. And if you can do things like pulping and compacting, you reduce the volume of that waste that goes into, into the landfill. So it, it's a step in the right direction if you don't have sustainable or compostable focused options. Now the remainder of this presentation will focus more on a sustainable approach to greening your food service um, because with that you can then add in the compostable factor. Okay, what do we do? First steps. Well, um, this I know is kind of difficult to read. Um, when we transitioned the slides, it, it kind of got blurry, but I'll, I'll kind of work through this. The first thing you need to do is evaluate your current disposables and what they're made of. This is going to be a real telling chart, and this is just an example. But if we go across the top, we have product group, and going down there, which may be difficult to read, going straight down that gray column, are things like um, plates and clamshell containers and to-go containers, cutlery, napkins, hot cups, cold cups, and you know food prep items like plastic wrap and foil wrap. And as we move to the right across these columns, you'll see there's a plastic group, and that's lavender, 
uh, a light blue, that's foam group, and then a, another light blue, that's the paper group. And then green is recyclable, yes or no, yellow compostable, the next is sustainable, and the next is pulpable. And the reason to do this exercise is to see how much plastic and foam you're actually using and can you migrate that over to the right into that paper group where you have tree paper, other fibers, which we'll get into in a minute, like uh, sugarcane fibers, wheat straw fibers, uh, palm fibers, um, or recycled fiber. Because if you notice when you slide across this chart, when you're talking about foams, they're, they're non-recyclable, non-compostable, non-sustainable, and non-pulpable. But when you get into the paper-based items, um, they may not be recyclable because they become a food scrap when you put food on them, but in most cases, they're compostable, they're sustainable, and they're pulpable, or it's possible that they're pulpable. So if you can take your purchases and move them more towards that paper grouping of products, either molded fiber papers, tree papers, or tree-free molded fibers, you'll have a better picture in it, and this chart should help you um, select the products a little bit better. So once we evaluate that, uh, we also have to do some additional evaluations. We need to look at our food purchases, especially seafood. Um, seafood now can be purchased in sustainable formats almost everywhere in the country. And later in the presentation, I'll give you some resources on how to do that. Um, to green your facility, buying produce that's produced locally and locally grown um, helps to reduce the carbon footprint of your overall operation because you don't have trucks that are driving hundreds of miles to distribution centers that are then driving to other distribution centers and moving their way down. Almost every major metropolitan area now you can get locally grown produce. Um, your uh, preparation methods should be evaluated. That includes a lot of things. That's a real broad topic, but very simple things are in the old days, before they had plastic film, you had steam pan lids. And going back to a steam pan lid eliminates the use of a lot of plastics and foils, which are very intensive to recycle or can't be recycled at all. Um, and also some of the cooking procedures that we use uh, there's always ways to save energy, and I'll get again, I'll get back to that later in the presentation, but these preparation methods need to be looked at and evaluated. And also your waste management procedures and waste reduction plans. If you have them, great. If you don't, there's things you can do. Again, compacting, pulping, uh, returning empty cartons for reuse. Uh, the produce companies a lot of times will take them back. Um, so this stuff can be repurposed and reused that all helps to the green message. Well, now that you have the basic information, uh, sorry, this is going to take a little while. These, what shall I do? Well, basically, um, what shall I do is a, a, a big, big concept. But let me tell you where to start here. Where you start typically to green your facility is with your disposables. Uh, it is very simple to replace foam tableware and foam to-go clamshells with sustainable fiber products that are made from high, uh, raw materials such as bamboo or wheat straw, sugar cane, uh, grass plasma, or even uh, recycled paper. Some of the products out there are recycled paper and, and they're molded fiber. Um, Replacing that foam with those type fiber products will allow them to be compostable, number one, pulpable, number two, and it will bring it into the realm of an annually renewable fiber base as opposed to uh, an expanded polystyrene foam, quote unquote styrofoam, that basically you're using a petrochemical that gets used one time and never disappears in the environment. One of the other things you can do is replace your foam hot cups with compostable PLA lined paper cups. There's several major manufacturers now that have these products. They're a forestry stewardship council paper, so they're a very sustainable paper. And instead of being coated with a plastic liner, they're coated with PLA, which is a natural corn-based plastic, a perfect alternative to hot cups. 
Um, another thing you can do is replace your cold cups with clear PLA cups or paper-based cups like all the fast food restaurants use. Um, paper-based cups and PLA cups work great if composting is available. If not, you can use recyclable polystyrene cups, which is a plastic cup, but at least you can get them recycled. Um, cutlery can be replaced by starch-based cutlery or PLA-based cutlery. There's a lot of cutlery options out there on the market now that are quote-unquote green. And straws, in the old days, straws were made out of paper. That's a very green product. Um, you can still get old-fashioned paper straws, or you can get straws made out of the new bio-based plastics. And all of these things compost, and they're annually renewable, and they're sustainable, which is what that green message needs to be. When we talk, oh, these are just some examples. These are, uh, if you look at this slide, uh, you'll see, you know, plates that are molded fiber. These happen to be sugar cane plates, uh, sugar cane clamshells and bowls. The iced tea is in a clear PLA, and PLA stands for polylactic acid. It's a, it's a plastic that's derived from corn. And the cup on the right there is a, a coffee cup, a hot paper coffee cup that has a natural plastic lining in it. It's a great product, doesn't leak, and obviously straws and cutlery. I wanted to give you a few resources here. Um, for sustainable seafood purchases, these organizations, Friend of the Sea, uh, Marine Stewardship Council, Fishwise, uh, they, you can go to their websites and they will give you lists upon lists of fish that they have deemed are sustainable in their current format. Also, the second one from the left there, that's uh, NOAA, our federal government. They have a fish, fish watch program. A tremendous amount of data and they can just provide you very simple data if you're looking at purchasing this fish or that fish they can tell you whether it's a sustainable fish and the Monterey Bay Aquarium same thing but they tell you whether it's actually sustainably fished not just the product itself but whether it's done in a sustainable manner um, as far as locally grown produce you really got to get with your produce people in your local area there's no real aggregated organization that you can go to and say boom there it is and we can uh, you know find locally grown produce um, we talked about uh, what do we do about energy conservation uh, you may or may not be aware but in most regions in the country if you do have to replace equipment you can replace it with energy star rated equipment and if you do please check with your local uh, utility because most of them have credits for replacing with high efficiency equipment and those credits can be 40 percent of the purchase cost and a lot of people aren't aware of that but they are nationwide all the major power companies do that um, some energy considerations for greening your food service operations turn off your equipment when it's not in use most equipment today heats very rapidly and cools down very rapidly so if you've got peak periods it's on, you can cycle on and off your equipment, save a tremendous amount of energy, which downstream saves the carbon footprint. Um, we talked about Energy Star. Uh, one simple little thing that saves a, not only a tremendous amount of money, but a tremendous amount of energy is to check your ventilation equipment. Number one, make sure it's operating properly. And number two, in food service, healthcare food service, typically back of the house production, You've got periods where you're using the equipment and periods where you're not. And if you shut down that ventilation, what it's going to do is not suck all of the heating and air conditioning out of your kitchen, which then needs to be replaced by more heating and air conditioning. So ventilation is extremely expensive from an energy standpoint. And just by turning it off when it's not in use saves a tremendous amount. Um, composting and waste reduction. I put up a couple of uh, a couple of pictures here um, to help you. If there is composting available in your area, I strongly encourage that you use it. Um, the uh, if you go to that website www.findacomposter.com, you can put in your zip code, and it will tell you if there's a commercial composter that services your area. It's a great website very simple to use. 
The other pictures I have here, I've got a couple of pulpers, just so you can see what they look like if you've never seen one. The one on the left is by Insincorator. The one on the right is by Somat. There's also National Conveyor makes pulpers, Hobart makes pulpers, so they're readily available. And they work great if you're working in conjunction with a composter because they significantly reduce the waste, almost by a factor of 10. So if you put 10 trash cans into a pulper, you only get one trash can of waste out after it grinds it up and takes the water out. So that means if you're working with a composter, your tipping fees are significantly reduced almost by a factor of 10. Um, when you're evaluating products, there's something called the Biodegradable Products Institute. And uh, that website is bpiworld.org. And they have a list of certified products that they deem certified as compostable in a commercial composting facility. So as you evaluate your products and you have questions, you can go to their website and take a look and see if that product is on there. Now, it doesn't mean that if it's not on there, it's not compostable. There's a lot of legalities to how this all gets done, but it's a good place to start. And then also the USDA, if, you, if you'd rather use the US government, the USDA has something called the Bio Preferred Program. And you can just go to usda.gov and type in the search bar Bio Preferred, and you can look at everything from tableware to you know uh, cleaners to lubricants and all kinds of things that are primarily bio-based materials. So it's a good resource. Now that being said, we decide, gee, we're going to change this out and we're going to replace some of this foam stuff and we're going to put in some sustainable materials and we're going to do this composting and okay, let's get to the nitty-gritty. What's this going to cost me? Well, um, as you can see by this chart, the, the, the numbers going up on the left are percent over styrofoam. So if you're using styrofoam, this is about what the percentage increase is going to be to go to a natural, sustainable, green fiber product that is like in performance. Um, if you're using other molded fibers or plastics, these numbers will come down significantly. But this is kind of like the worst case scenario. And to boil all this down, basically for an in-house tray in a retail cafeteria in a hospital setting, the average cost increase is anywhere from 12 to 20 cents per meal. The average cost increase on a to-go is between 6 and 12 cents. The reason there's a difference is obviously if somebody's taking something to go, they have less pieces that they're taking out the door. Now, a lot of folks come to me when I talk about this and they say, you know, look, I can't afford a 30% increase in my disposable cost. And I get it. An effective strategy that's been used by management companies across the country uh, that I'm involved with and private uh, hospitals that I've consulted with and that use these types of products is to wait to implement a disposable change at the same time they expect to have a price increase. So if they're going to increase their prices 3%, let's say, at the register, um, spreading an additional 20 cents out over uh, a couple of beverages and a dessert and an entree and a starch and a vegetable is only 3 or 4 cents per item or two or three cents, and it's basically transparent to the customer. So if it's an issue of budgeting and, and your administration says to you, you're going to do this, but we're not going to give you any budget, I would wait until it's time to have a price increase cycle and then filter it in at that point, and it should be fairly transparent to everybody concerned. Um, other cost impacts that weren't addressed on the chart, uh, seafood purchases in the major metropolitan area, if you go to sustainable seafood, it should show very little change. Basically what we're doing is just shifting from one fish item to a different fish item. Um, something that is sustainably caught versus something that's not. Uh, produce purchases will show a moderate increase in price as of today. Locally grown, smaller farmers, smaller distribution, uh, not buying from one of the broadline produce houses, it does cost a little bit more. Uh, what that percentage is truly depends on the area you're in. If you're in a more rural area, that percentage probably is negligible. 
if you're farther out away from where products are grown, it tends to go up a little bit. Uh, I don't have an exact percentage, but you can expect a small increase. Um, what pulping does from a cost standpoint is it reduces your tipping charges, not your tonnage charges. So you really have to look at how you're paying for your waste management. And if you're paying by the ton, well, I still encourage you to pulp, but you're still going to pay for the same time. If you're paying a ton and a tipping charge, and a tipping charge is when the truck backs up and tips the can into their can, uh, well, that tipping charge is going to be significantly reduced, almost by a factor of, like I said, 7 to 10. Um, efficient equipment will reduce operating costs, but the problem is it's not typically reflected in the food service budget. That goes into the administration's operating budget, but still goes to the message of greening your facility. And composting typically doesn't change your cost structure. It may increase the labor if you have sorting issues, but once you get dialed in and you have the proper waste receptacles at your, your tray drop-off line in your cafeterias and people get used to putting you know, PET bottles in the recycle and glass here and food waste here and what have you, it's pretty much sorted for you. And uh, it can then go through the pulper and the composter can pick it up and it should be fairly cost neutral to you. Um, now, that all being said, at some point you're going to call your distributor in and say, look, we got to go green and show me the product offering. And I thought I'd put a slide up here for you to get an idea of the kind of questions or the line of questioning you should have for that distributor salesperson or that factory or manufacturer rep or broker that's in there trying to show you these products. The first question, is the disposable item proposed from sustainable raw materials? And I say that because there's a lot of chemicals now that they're throwing into ordinary plastics that kind of make them compostable and they're waving the slag around, but it doesn't mean it's a sustainable raw material. So it really doesn't follow a green message all the way down. It may make someone feel good, but it's really not what green is about. So you have to ask that question. And is the disposable item compostable to ASTM standards or third-party verified compostable? I encounter every week manufacturers that have compostable stamped all over everything. And in some states, in California, for example, it's illegal to use the word compostable anywhere in your marketing or anywhere on your packaging if you do not have a test result readily available. And there's a half a dozen other states across the U.S. that have the same type of rules. So you have to ask, is there a test? You know, can I see a test? I mean, it's great to say it, but show me the test. And the federal government also says if you're going to call it compostable, you better have a test. Um, is the proposed disposable pulpable? Most of them are, but you need to make sure, and that's a question for your pulping manufacturer, whether it's a Somat or a Hobart or a National or what have you. But you do have to ask that question. Um, and what is this? This is something that's real important to ask the distributor. I need to know what the manufacturer's green statement is. Um, I can't tell you how many times I have listened to folks walk into facilities with a piece of plastic that they've been selling for 20 years and say, it's green now. And when the client says, why is it green now, the manufacturer says, well, we mixed in 15% recycled plastic, so that makes it green. <laughs> well, that kind of doesn't really meet the overall goal of being green here. Um, again, we want to be sustainable. We want to look at some end of use stuff. and having a, a, a piece of plastic, a plastic soda cup lid or whatever that has 10 or 15 percent recycled plastic in it, that then it's going to end up in the landfill. That's what we call in this industry greenwashing. So saying something's green doesn't necessarily mean it's green. And the only way to kind of get to the bottom of it is to check the manufacturer's green statement. They all have them on their websites. It tells you what they believe green is and then you can determine whether or not you feel that that is really green. So what's next? We've talked to the distributors. We've selected the product. We bring it in. Everything's moving along fine. And now we say, well, gee, what's in the future? What's coming up? Well, what I see on the horizon are green, tree-free, soft paper goods. And those are things like uh, 
may not affect your department directly, but things like uh, bath tissue, facial tissues, other type of soft paper goods that are now 100% tree fiber free and they perform exactly like regular paper products and tissue products, no trees in them. Um, I see very shortly some compostable tray line components that are disposable. Right now, all of the things you use on your tray line, some maybe are compostable, but they're really not sustainable, a lot of plastics. I see that changing in the very near future. Um, increased variety of sustainable pulp products. What I mean by that, right now we focus on to-go containers and plates. Um, I've seen some companies that are bringing out uh, pulp steam table pans that are single use and they go right through your pulper when they're done and they go right to the composter and they compost out. So there's some new variety of those type things coming. Uh, some more different to-go items also uh, in sustainable. There's new uh, new resins and new products that are coming out in the next 90 days that will then be formed into a whole variety of new to-go items. Uh, there's going to be an increased focus on locally grown. That's already happening. And also an increase, I can't see that bottom slide, but um, an increase in the availability of sustainable seafoods. So. Um, I want to thank you. I, I don't know, Marsha, if we're going to have uh, live questions. If there are any, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Um, if not, uh, I don't know how we uh... get some questions here. If anyone has questions, um, if anyone has questions and wants to hit next to their name, I can unmute them. They can ask the question live or they can send it in. One of the questions that did come through that I did catch is, with the future of greening, will that food become more expensive? Will the seafood, will that elevate the cost of doing green business? No, what's happening, what I'm seeing in the seafood end of it is that um, the major players, the large volume consumers, um, the, uh, the, the compass worldwide, the Sodexos worldwide, they're starting to demand this product. So it's becoming more prevalent. And as it becomes more prevalent and gets into the distribution channels, it actually gets less expensive. Um, locally grown produce, when we talk about the, the produce side of the food cost, I think that has a little ways to go. Um, seafood is, is a lot larger of an industry. And it's the way it's handled is a lot differently different than produce. But we're seeing in some of the metro areas. I, I know I've seen it in Chicago. I've seen it in LA. Uh, I've seen it in North Carolina. Some some metro areas, they're starting to aggregate this produce, this locally grown. And there's smaller companies, not the big giant broadliners, but smaller produce companies that are able to do this and deliver it to you fresh every other day, locally grown. And from what I'm being told. It's a minimal cost increase, minimal. Um, I'm going to, I think Joy had a question. Joy? Joy Kadra? No. Oh, no, okay. I didn't. I'm sorry. I okay. the wrong button. That's OK. That's OK. Just making sure. All right. So I'm looking down. And one other question. Yes, Meredith? Okay. Meredith? Yes, you have a question? Yes. Yes. Maris, you have a question? Yes. We were interested. What is the legal definition of green? Uh, that's the problem. There isn't one. Um, the Federal Trade Commission would be the one that's kind of responsible for formulating what the definitions are of green are, and what they have. The only definitions they have are something called uh, the FTC guidelines for environmental claims. And you can go to the ftc.gov website, and you can download that, that pamphlet, if you will. And basically, what th there's no definition for green. And, and like I mentioned in the beginning, it's kind of like you have to step back and say, what are my goals? And do they benefit the environment over what I'm doing? And kind of develop it yourself. The, the Federal Trade Commission guideline is based on advertising and how people present their products. 
and they just say if you make any type of an environmental claim, essentially, you better not be misleading and you better have substantiated test results that can be provided immediately to the consumer. And without, I mean, I'm boiling down 20 some odd pages, but that's basically it. I, I hope that answers your question. I, 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 there is no real definition and there's no governing body that's going to make one. All right, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I think one other question is, what's the easiest way to get started? The easiest way, the fastest way to get started is to evaluate your disposables. That's uh, your retail disposables because nine out of ten times someone's using foam. And uh, expanded polystyrene foam is troublesome because it never leaves the environment and it goes to the landfill and it's there for, our, you know, for our purposes almost forever. Um, so just by starting to change things like coffee cups away from foam and into paper-based or fiber-based products, um, you're, you're, you're taking a huge step um, because those can then be pulped or they can go into the compost stream where foam never can. So that's a quick, easy step. Just start looking at replacing your foams. Thank you. Michael, you have a question. Hi. Um, I understand that uh, the compost makes a um, very good ingredient for organic fertilizer. Um, evidently, when it's turned into um, a proper fertilizer to replace the, the synthetic um, oil-based fertilizers um, with the ingredients of food and and cardboard and uh, all the other packaging components, it um, um, is a very good um, fertilizer in as much that if the nitrate is a slow release, it builds up the soil and it retains the uh, moisture. Do you have much information on the focus of taking that compost and turning it into organic fertilizer? Only personal information from my composting activity that I've done since I was a teenager. Um, I can tell you that the, the simplest recipe for compost is about four parts green stuff or, or living type stuff and one part uh, carbon based or dead type stuff and in the case of like your food service if you had one part cardboard or paper based and four parts organic uh, you know apple cores vegetable trimmings, things like that, uh, that's when that compost will begin to fire off. Um, if you're planning on doing it yourself at, at the facility, believe it or not, there are items available and you'll need to do some, some web searching, but there's some large volume composting machines for hospitals. And as long as you keep that four to one ratio, uh, you'll be pretty good at it. And uh, yeah, it, it what I use the compost, I make compost teas when I'm watering my indoor plants, and the actual direct compost itself is all in my garden. My garden's fully organic. So there's there's a ton of information. On, yeah, there's a ton of information on the internet about compost and how to make it and how to make composters, and you can do it as simply. I've done it in trash cans where you just drill holes in the trash can to get air into it, and the stuff will compost Thank down. Thank you, Michael. Okay, and we have a question from William. William? Bill or William? Hello? Bill Cartwright? No? I guess. Okay. If Let me see if there's any more questions. Oh, we have another question from Jean Seller. Jean. Jean? Hello, Jean? Am I not hitting it right? Okay. Anthony, do you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, I'm just making sure that I'm uh, released. Okay, all right. Well, then let me put this back. And I have a question from... Okay, from Christine. Christine, you have a question? Well, I sent the email. Um, 
Okay. It's, uh, in our area, the EPA refuses to approve compost facilities. Can you say that again? I can. I couldn't hear you. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Um, in our our area of Northwest Ohio, we can't have a commercial composting facility approved. They're concerned about groundwater contamination. Right. And of course, our students here on campus are asking for these. You know, of course, they could just use the um, not carry stuff out. That would help. Uh, but is there any movement at the legislative level to make this an easier process? It's state by state. Um, that's the problem. I live in California. And there's, you know, you would think we would be at the forefront of this, and the Waste Management Board has consistently denied uh, applications and permits for compost, green, what they call food scrap waste compost facilities for, for years. And they're concerned about vector, you know, insect control and gases and odors. And so it's really state by state and local locality by locality. Um, are you a university? Yes. Um, check with UC Davis. And our, uh, What's that? Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm just talking to myself, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, it, you can check with UC Davis in their extension program. They've done an extensive amount of testing on uh, large-scale composters that can be put behind your building. So it's, it looks like a big trash compactor, but it's actually an in-vessel composter. Okay. A lot of the work was done at UC Davis, and I'm sure they've got the information. They can, I, I don't know what department it was in. Um, I was involved in it several years ago, but I know they've moved forward. I see it come up in the trade rags occasionally. Um, but they, they've done the most work on composting their food scrap there, and it's all done in-house. All right, another question was, any advice for making I it affordable? Uh, oh. I'm sorry. Do you have another question? No, go ahead. It was more comments. Okay. Um, I have another question that um, any advice for making it affordable to offer green in to go containers for the hospital? Uh, yeah, the, the molded fiber stuff uh, you can purchase on the open market for about, they're, they're, a standard three compartment is, is about 16, 17 cents on the market. Uh, a foam is about 13 cents, 14 cents. So is there something that, that's cost neutral to foam in a to go container? No. Uh, is there something that's close enough where, again, if you implement during a price increase cycle, it adds three cents to the meal it costs um, over what you're doing now? So that's kind of the answer. It's a little bit more money, but it, I would just implement at the same time as a cost, you know, a standard cost increase. And another question was: I work in a military medical center, and one of the many problems, one of the problems of the medical military hospitals have had been with trying to use green disposables. Um, how can we do this more affordably? And again, that was brought up. Another question. Um, well, if it's a military hospital, go to biopreferred.gov or, or the USDA because they've got an offset allowance. If, if uh, it, it depends on your particular budget and what you need to purchase, but um, there are some laws on the books that say if there is sustainable and green and bio-based option available, it needs to be used over a petroleum-based product. And that's explained uh, on that bio-preferred website. Um, and, and again, it's part of the USDA. I think it's run through University of Iowa. So uh, as far as cost effectively, um, it, it, it depends on what, you, it, what the value is. If, if you, the value in your facility is on the bottom line and the price, and that's it. What is this going to cost me? I, you know, I, I, I don't know. This stuff's going to be a little bit more money. If the value is, we would like to do, you know, benefit the environment both from a sustainability standpoint and from an end of use standpoint. There may be some cost differences at this point, but it's been coming down every year, getting closer to foam. So, um, and let me check if there's any other questions. Um, I think that's it.
Thank you very much, Anthony. If you have any other questions or want to phone me any other feedback, please um, send your feedback to Twitter, and you can send your questions to Marsha Diamond, or you can um, send Anthony Russo an email directly. So thank you for joining us today. Happy holidays. Um, hopefully it will be a green one in many ways. And um, have a great afternoon. Thank you.